Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here at the end of a crazy semester. Um, my name is Joy Rohde. I'm the interim director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy program here at the Ford School of Public Policy. And today I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. But first, I need to thank a number of people who made today's event possible. First of all, the Ford School, the Policy Talks program, thank you very much. Um, our talk today is also co-sponsored by the School of Information, the Science, Technology, and Society program, and Poverty Solutions. And so uh, on behalf of STPP, we thank these programs for their support. Today's talk is also supported by our STPP graduate certificate students who run a group that is open to students across the university, um, regardless of whether or not they're in the science, technology, and public policy program, but who are interested in science and technology policy. The group is called Inspire. They're awesome. And um, they are also co-sponsors of today's event. Uh, now to introduce our speaker. Professor Virginia Eubanks is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University at Albany, SUNY. She's the author of Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police, and Punish the Poor. And I think it's one of the most important books I've read in the last few years. She's also the author of Digital Dead End, Fighting for Social Justice in the Information Age, and co-editor with Alethea Jones of Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, 40 Years of Movement Building with Barbara Smith. Her writing about technology and social justice appears not only in academic print, but in the American Prospect, The Nation, Harper's, Wired, and other outlets. For two decades, Professor Eubanks has worked in community technology and economic justice movements. And I think for those of us who are scholars who also aspire to make a difference in the policy world, her work and her career are, um, are great models for us. She's a fellow at the New America Foundation, and she's also a founding member of the Our Data Bodies Project, which is an organization that works in communities to um, demonstrate how digital data collection and storage systems of different types impact things like community reentry, impact access to fair housing, access to public assistance, and community development programs. So just to orient you, following Dr. Eubanks' talk, there's going to be a Q&A, and there are um, little pencils and note cards going around. I encourage you to um, share your questions. That way, staff will come around and pick them up. Um, so, and if you want to do it via Twitter, it's hashtag policy talks. Um, today we have two STPP students uh, helping us with the Q&A. Our Inspire leaders, Jackson Voss down here and Laura Greer, and they are assisted by my right hand, uh, the STPP program manager, Dr. Molly Kleinman. After the Q&A, we'd like you to join us in the Great Hall for a reception. There's also a book signing. Uh, and. Let's just get right to it. Please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Virginia Eubanks. Thank you, guys. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the end of the semester. I cannot believe you're here. Um, so it snowed today. It was icy. It is the last week of the semester, and I'm just very, very impressed. So um, I'm incredibly flattered and gratified um, to be here to be part of this conversation. Um, great thanks to both Molly and Joy um, and Aaron and everyone else who not only thought to invite me um, and, and support that invitation, but also did all the hard work to get my physical body here from upstate New York um, at the, at the uh, mid point of a winter now. We would think it would be early winter, but this is our third or fourth snow now. So um, I just really appreciate all the hard work that went into getting me here um, and, and want to say thank you for that. So um, my plan for today uh, is to talk for maybe 40 minutes about the book. I'm going to assume that most people haven't read it, give you a, bit, a little bit of the story of the book. Um, I'm going to try to do that with a real focus on introducing you to some of the families who shared their stories with me when I was doing the reporting for this book. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that the folks who went on the record with their real name and their real experiences for this book were, did so at enormous personal risk. 
um, that many of them were currently um, relying on public assistance for their basic public, uh, for, I'm sorry, for their basic material needs, things like uh, food or shelter, um, folks who are unhoused, um, or folks who are currently um, part of a child welfare investigation. Um, for them to talk on the record about their experiences is a great gift. Um, and so I try to always make sure that we're um, starting from their points of view and um, that I acknowledge how much of this work is made possible um, by their incredible gen generosity and courage. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, history. I'm going to talk a little bit about the three stories I tell in the book. And then I'm going to just sort of draw, some, draw out some common ideas that I think are worth talking about more, or the sort of ideas that are portable um, out of the stories that I tell. Um, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for conversation, for questions and answers. So that's my goal. Um, we're going to hopefully start out with good energy. I ask um, when everybody's energy is still good to give me like up twinkle fingers and when you start to fade like the, the fingers come down and when you really need me to shut up honestly you can give me the downward twinkle fingers and I'll stop uh, eventually um, not right away but I will take it into account um, so that's the overall sort of plan for the time we have together does that sound good to folks we all right twinkle fingers if you're good yeah okay thank you good um, I always like to, um, uh, to have a little bit of feedback for, ha for how we're going. Okay, so I'm here to propose that we're um, building uh, a digital poorhouse. That despite the fact that new data-driven um, digital technology has incredible potential to lower barriers in social assistance, to speed results, to create efficiencies and cost savings, what we're actually doing is building an invisible institution that's made up of decision-making algorithms, automated eligibility processes, and statistical models across social services in the United States. So I'm going to talk today about how the rise of this digital poorhouse responds to and kind of recreates a narrative of austerity, this idea that there's not enough for everyone and we have to make really tough choices about who deserves to attain their basic human rights. So even though we like to talk about our newest technologies as disruptors, the tools that I talk about in automating inequality are really more evolution than revolution. Um, and their historical roots go really, really far back in our history, um, at least to the 1820s. Um, and here's the moment where I always take a second to note that my wonderful editor at St. Martin's, Elizabeth Disagard, um, helped convince me that I didn't need to go back to 1600 to start the history <laughs> in what was originally a 95-page history chapter that started the book um, and helped convince me that getting it down to a svelte 200-year, 26-page history of poverty policy was probably enough. Um, so I write a fair amount about history um, in the book. Um, but I'm just going to talk about one moment in that history today. So um, it, around 1819, there was a huge um, and a, a very a crushing economic depression in the United States. Um, and economic elites got very, very nervous, both because of um, the, the economic crisis, but also because of some really fearless organizing that poor and working people were doing to protect their families and their rights. So. Um, as economic elites do, they responded by commissioning a series of studies. And the studies asked, um, what's the real cause of suffering here? Is it poverty? Is it lack of access to resources? Or is it what they called at the time pauperism, which meant dependence on public benefits? So this is the, how the studies are set up. What's the problem? Is it poverty or is it dependence? What do you guys think um, the answer to the studies was? Dependence, right, exactly. So this does not surprise us because we're still um, doing the same studies and finding the same results now. Um, so the solution for them was then to create a set of brick and mortar public institutions that um, basically raised the barriers to receipt of public assistance so high um, that uh, no one except for the absolutely most desperate people um, would possibly apply or ask for help. Um, so what they did was build what was in, uh, originally intended to be a network of um, uh, 
public poor houses in every county in the United States. And they required um, as one of the conditions of, con of receipt of public assistance entering into this institution. And this is really no easy choice. They were technically voluntary, though you could be sentenced to a poorhouse as, as well. So many of the people who were there were truly inmates in the, in the real sense of the word, though all of them were re referred to as inmates. Um, but folks who were entering voluntarily or folks who were sentenced to the poorhouse were re required to give up established rights. Um, and this is 1820, so not everyone shared these rights, but some of the rights that you lost were the right to vote, to hold office, the right to marry, and also uh, the right to fam family integrity. So folks entering the poorhouse often lost their children because um, the idea at the time was that poor children could be rehabilitated by interacting more with wealthier families. Um, and by interaction, they usually meant working for free as agricultural or domestic laborers. Um, and finally, death rates at these institutions were often just really astronomical, often as high as 30% annually, meaning about a third of people who entered the poorhouse every year um, died. So people were literally taking their lives in their hands in entering these institutions. Um, yours, by the way, uh, was on um, Washtenaw Ave near Platte. It is now where the County Farm Park is. This is a key word, by the way. County Farm means that's where the poorhouse was. Uh, if you have a County Farm Road or a County Farm Park, um, that's true. Became the county infirmary after the rise of welfare in the 30s. Closed not until 1971. Um, and there's actually a very strong UM, uh, UMICH connection, um, though it is an unfortunate one, which is after 1880, unclaimed bodies from the poorhouse were given to the University of Michigan for dissection um, if their families did not claim them within 24 hours. So um, this is one of the great fun things I get to do in every new town I go to, is look up uh, where your poorhouse was and what its story was. Um, you have some pretty good records, by the way. So if you look at the Historical Society, they have some good records um, from the poorhouse. I suggest someone go write about it right now. OK, so um, I use this metaphor of the digital poorhouse um, to illustrate what I think of as like the deep social programming, or for the sort of technically minded in the crowd, the legacy programming. Um, of today's digital tools and social services. So at their heart is this decision that we made back in the 1820s that public service programs should act more as moral thermometers, separating the deserving from the undeserving, diverting the able or enforcing work, rather than as a universal floor under everyone. So I want us also to not just think about history, but to think about this political moment, about why this spe these specific tools have become popular at this particular time. Because um, I think that these high-tech tools that are intended to establish eligibility, to predict behavior, to measure effectiveness, have risen to prominence in social services now for three reasons. First, they rationalize and recreate a politics of austerity, this idea that there are, just aren't enough resources and we have to make hard decisions. The second, that they, um, they promise to address bias, but in fact, they just really hide it. And third, they create what I think of as a kind of empathy override that eases the emotional burden of making what are, I think, inhumanly difficult decisions about who among America's 43 million poor deserve support. So I'm going to use each of those points to introduce one of the stories I tell in the book. Um, and I will um, introduce both the families I spoke to and the technologies that I write about. Um, so first point is this point about the digital poorhouse assuming austerity. And because it assumes austerity, recreates it. So I dedicate automating inequality to um, a severely disabled young girl um, named Sophie Stipes. And when Sophie was six, she received a letter from the state of Indiana that told her that she would be losing her Medicaid because she had, quote, failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility for the program. So this happened just as she was gaining weight um, uh, for really for the first time in a significant way in her life because she had recently had a, a feeding tube um, implanted, a gastrointestinal feeding tube implanted, and she was learning to walk for the first time. So the Stipes family was caught up 
in an attempt to automate all the eligibility processes for the state's welfare system. So um, that's for TANA for cash assistance, for Medicaid or medical um, insurance, and for what at the time was called food stamps and is now called SNAP. So in 2006, then Governor Mitch Daniels um, signed what would eventually be a $1.34 billion contract with a consortium of companies including IBM and ACS, Affiliated Computer Systems, to create a system that replaced the hands-on work of local um, county welfare caseworkers with online applications and private regional call centers. The result was a million benefits denials in the first three years of the project, of the experiment, mostly for this catch-all reason, failure to cooperate, which meant that um, just that somewhere, someone somewhere in the process had made a mistake. So the mistake could be the applicants. They could have forgotten to sign page 34 of a 50-page application. It could have been um, the fault of a call center worker who um, misapplied policy and gave someone bad advice. Or it could just be um, some part of the computer system, like the document scanning center. They could have accidentally scanned a document in it upside down or dropped something behind a desk. Or someone could have photocopied a driver's license and then faxed it to the document copying center where it was scanned. And if you copy and then fax and then scan a driver's license, of course, you just get a black box on a white background. Um, but the, the notices that people like Sophie Stipes received simply said that there was an error, not what the error was. Um, and because it severed the relationship between applicants for public assistance and the folks who had in the past been caseworkers who were responsible for dockets of cases and now were responsible for lists of computerized tasks rather than families, because that relationship had been severed, the system virtually guaranteed that the burden of finding and fixing any problems with the application process fell squarely and solely on the shoulders of applicants, who were some of the most vulnerable people in the state. And I just want to tell you one story um, about someone who lost their benefits um, during the attempted automation. Um, and this is the story of Omega Young. So in the fall of 2008, Omega Young of Evansville missed an appointment to recertify for Medicaid because she was in the hospital suffering from terminal cancer. The cancer that began in her ovaries had spread to her kidneys, breast, and liver. Her chemotherapy left her weak and emaciated. Young, a round-faced, umber-skinned mother of two grown sons, struggled to meet the new system's requirements. So she called her local help center and let them know that she couldn't make this phone recertification appointment because she'd be in the hospital. Um, but her medical benefits and her food stamps were still cut off for failure to cooperate. Because she lost her benefits, Young was unable to afford her medications. She struggled to pay her rent. She lost access to free transportation to her medical appointments. And Omega Young died on March 1st, 2009. On the next day, on March 2nd, she won an appeal for wrongful termination, and all of her benefits were restored. So that's Omega Young and the Indiana um, automate, auto, um, eligibility automation. So the second point I want to raise is um, that we believe that these new digital tools are objective and neutral, but they often just hide bias. Um, and in this case, I want to actually start with a family and then talk about the system. So I want to talk to you uh, um, just briefly about Patrick Grebe and Angel Shepherd. So I met Patrick and Angel at um, the Duquesne Family Support Center, which is like a community hub um, where families who are child welfare, um, who are involved in the child welfare system, um, attend programs, access resources, connect with other families, provide peer support. Um, and they didn't stand out to me right away as sort of interesting people to report on um, because their experience was so average. It was really almost mundane characteristic of the sort of routine indignities that are experienced by um, white working class people. So they've struggled with low wage, dangerous work, poor quality public schools and predatory online education, poor health, community violence. But through it all, they've remained really creative and involved parents. Um, so Patrick, I talk about him in the book as, I think I describe him as like a Buddhist ex-biker. Um, he's this like rectangle of a man, this like really large man with um, like really elaborate facial hair um, and the sense of incredible calm. 
Um, and one of their favorite parenting techniques, um, uh, they're raising, they're helping to raise um, two young girls, um, Angel's daughter, Harriet, and Patrick's daughter's daughter, Desiree. And the girls are roughly the same age. And because they're so close to, to each other in age, they bicker a lot. And so um, <laughs> when they're bickering too much, what Angel and Patrick do is put them in what they refer to as the get-along shirt. And the get-along shirt is one of Patrick's like enormous button-down shirts. So they shove both the girls into the get-along shirt. Um, each girl puts one arm through one of the arms of the shirt and the other arm around the waist of the other girl. And then they button the shirt back up. And they're not allowed to get out of the get-along shirt until they start, stop fighting. Um, even if they have to go to the bathroom. And this is the thing that Patrick says always works. As soon as someone has to pee, they stop fighting. Um, <laughs> So despite this, Angel and Patrick have really racked up um, like a lifetime of interactions with Children, Youth, and Family Services, which is what CPS is called in Pennsylvania. Um, so Patrick was investigated for medical neglect in the early 2000s because he was unable to afford a, um, an antibiotic prescription after his daughter's um, visit to an emergency room. And then when Harriet, Angel's daughter, was five, someone phoned in a string of reports to the child abuse and neglect hotline. This was an anonymous tipster, and they explained that Harriet was running around the neighborhood unsupervised, that she was down the block teasing a dog, that she wasn't being properly clothed, fed, or bathed, that she wasn't getting needed medication. So for each call, an investigator came out to the house, interviewed Harriet and Tabitha, Angel and Patrick, looked in all the cupboards, under all the beds, and requested access to the family's medical records. And then each time, finding no evidence of maltreatment, they closed the case. So each of these interactions was entered into the family's digital case file, which is held in an integrated data warehouse um, in the county, which feeds what's known as the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, which is the tool that I uh, report on um, uh, in, in here in Allegheny County, which is the county where Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania. So Patrick and Angel are aware that um, each interaction they have with the sort of wide variety array of services they receive from the county um, can potentially raise their risk score in this predictive model. And they described to me um, feeling like they lived in a state of sort of low-grade constant terror, that there would be another call on the family, and that the algorithm would target their daughter or their granddaughter for investigation and possibly for removal to foster care. So Angel said to me, quote, you feel like a prisoner. You feel trapped. It's like no matter what you do, it's not good enough for them. My daughter's now nine, and I'm still afraid that they're going to come up one day, see her out by herself, pick her up, and say, you can't have her anymore. So the Allegheny Family Screening Tool is built on top of a data warehouse that was um, uh, created in um, 1999. As of the writing of the book, it held a billion records. That's more than 800 for every individual living in Allegheny County. Um, but, uh, of course, the warehouse doesn't actually collect data or information on every member uh, and on every county resident equally. Um, in fact, the data extracts mostly come from um, county and state public service programs and agencies that interact a lot with poor and working class families. So the system gets regular data extracts, for example, from adult and juvenile probation, from the jails and prisons, from county medical, uh, mental health services, from the county office of drugs and alcohol, addiction recovery, the state office of income maintenance, which is the uh, state's version of, of welfare, um, the public schools, and a number of other agencies. Um, so the limits of this data set really shape what the model is able to predict, is able to see. Um, and because it relies almost entirely on information that's only collected about poor and working class um, uh, families, the ways that it sees risk and harm are, um, are shaped by the kinds of experiences that poor and working class people have with the state. 
Um, so of course, professional middle class families also need help with their parenting because everybody needs help with their parenting. Um, they probably request equal amounts of support, but often they're paying for it privately. So if you need um, addiction recovery support and you're professional middle class, you're likely going to get that through um, employer provided insurance. Um, if you're getting it through private insurance, that information doesn't end up in the data warehouse. So information about the behavior that um, could be described as missing um, from uh, the data warehouse. Um, if you need help with your child care, but you can afford to pay a nanny or a babysitter out of pocket, then information about your family won't end up in the data warehouse. Um, so um, those, um, those limitations in the data set itself um, really caused enormous concern for folks that I talked to when I was doing my reporting in Allegheny County. So parents mostly saw um, false positives problems, problems that um, basically false positives just means seeing um, risk of harm where no harm actually exists. Um, and this makes sense for parents, right? Parents said to me that they felt like the system confuses parenting while poor with poor parenting. And, it, and they felt like it was creating a system of poverty profiling that because it spent so much time um, investigating, um, uh, investigating and risk rating families in their communities sort of created a feedback loop of injustice that began um, with um, families having more data collected about them because they are interacting with county systems. Having more interactions meant their score was higher because their score was higher. They were investigated more often because they were investigated more often. More data was collected, right, and back around. Um, so it became kind of a feedback loop um, in the same way that um, many people have expressed concerns that predictive policing creates um, feedback loops. Um, from the point of view of intake call screeners, who are the front line of the social service system in child welfare, they're the folks who pick up the phone um, when a call comes into the anonymous um, hotline or who um, collect reports from mandated reporters and make a decision of which, um, uh, which cases to refer for full investigation and which ones to screen out. Um, Frontline call center workers, um, intake screening workers, were really concerned with false negatives, but for the same reason that parents were concerned with false positives. So false negatives are not seeing harm where harm might actually exist. So intake call screeners felt that since there wasn't data about professional middle class families in the data warehouse, the kinds of behavior that might lead to abuse or neglect in those families wouldn't be recognized by this predictive algorithm, and they may miss really key information about the kinds of harm that happens, for example, in more geographically isolated places or in the suburbs. Um, but that information would not be in the system. So the model's designers and administrators um, say that part of the point of this system is to root out bias in the system. And um, I think it's really important to be very direct that bias in child welfare is a profound issue in almost every county in the United States. So the way that most people talk about it um, is around racial disproportionality. Um, in Alle Allegheny County, like just about every county in the United States, has serious issues with racial disproportionality in their child welfare system. Something like 38% of children in, of youth in foster care in Allegheny County are black or biracial, while they only make up 19% of the youth population. So they're about twice um, uh, as likely to end up in foster care as they should be based on their proportion of the population. Um, and Allegheny County has been very serious about addressing this disproportionality. Um, and part of that um, move has been to try to keep a closer eye on the patterns of decision making of these intake call screeners I was just talking about a moment before. So this tool is intended to supplement their decision making. Um, they uh, make two clinical decisions, put it in the system, then they run this tool, and this risk score shows up on sort of a thermometer, green at the bottom, red at the top, um, that goes from zero to 20. Um, at the time I was reporting, if you got a score of 18 or above, the system automatically launched an investigation. Um, since the publication of the book, they've actually dropped that threshold. And now if you have a score of 15 or above, the system automatically launches 
um, an investigation. So the thing that's really interesting about the idea that this tool can help them address bias and what the administrators um, told me was that they don't think that this tool necessarily can solve racial disproportionality, but they it can help them identify it earlier and try to address it earlier. Um, the issue with that is that the county's own research shows that um, intake call screening is not the point at which um, disproportions entering the system, that discrimination is entering the system. Actually, the point that the, the lion's share of discrimination is entering the system is the point at which the community calls on families. So um, black and biracial families are called on three and a half times more often than white families. That means reported either to the hotline or by mandated reporters. So that's a 350% difference. Um, once that case gets to an intake call screener, there is a bit of disproportion that enters at that moment. So um, call screeners screen in 69% of cases involving black and biracial families and only 65% of um, cases involving um, white families, but that's a 4% um, uh, difference rather than a 350% difference. And this is something I think I've, is profoundly important to pay attention to because to me this sounds like a very sophisticated uh, and expensive tool um, aimed at the point at which the problem is not entering the system. Um, the problem is entering the system at, a, at the point of referral, which is very much about our cultural understandings of what a good, safe, and healthy family looks like. And in the United States, that family looks white and heterosexual and rich. Um, and my concern, or among my concerns, is that actually removing discretion from those frontline workers could remove a stop to the massive amount of discrimination that's entering earlier in the process um, and, and could potentially worsen inequality in the system um, rather than making it better. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about this. So, um, one of the things that I think is really important about this is uh, about this system is that the way that folks talk about um, it as removing discretion um, or removing bias from the system. And I have a very smart political science friend named Joe Sauce, um, and he says that um, discretion is like energy. Um, it's never um, actually created or destroyed. It's only ever moved. Um, so I think the really interesting question, among the really interesting questions to ask about this system is, is not to frame the question as, are we removing discretion? Are we removing bias from the system? But is, who are we taking discretion away from and who are we giving it to? And how, that might, how might that affect bias in the system? So in this case, we're removing discretion from frontline um, social service workers in child protective. And these are some of the most diverse working class and female parts of the labor force um, in child welfare. And we're giving it to um, economi the economists and the computer scientists and the social scientists who are building the models. And I think that actually creates new issues around bias, um, particularly because they tend to be much farther away from the problems that these tools are meant to help address. Um, lots more to say about that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on um, for now. And we're gonna skip the proxy side too. Ask me about proxies in the system um, if we have time in the, in the Q&A. But I want to make sure that we have time to talk about the, the system that I reported on in Los Angeles. How are we doing? We still up here? We middle? We down? We're starting to get middly, OK, because people won't tell me. That's all right. We're starting to get middly. So we're going to go fast through this um, and get to questions. Um, so my final point is that these tools, um, I think at their worst, can serve as a kind of empathy override. So they can outsource to computers or allowing us to outsource to computers some of the most difficult decisions that we face as a society. So for example, the system that I um, reported on in Los Angeles, which is called the Coordinated Entry System, not just in Los Angeles, by the way, very widely used across the country and around the world, um, responds to the county's extraordinary 
housing crisis. So as of um, the 2017 point in time count, there are 58,000 unhoused people in Los Angeles County. I live in a small city in upstate New York. There are 10,000 more people homeless in Los Angeles County than live in my whole city, right? So this is a, a, a human rights issue of uh, astonishing proportion. And something like a full 75% of unhoused people in Los Angeles County have no shelter at all. So no emergencies, no emergency shelter. They're just living in tents and encampments um, on the sidewalk. Um, in, in cars. Um, so this system, the coordinated um, entry system, works by assigning each unhoused person who they manage to survey a score on a spectrum of vulnerability. And to do this, they use a survey with a kind of a terrible acronym. It's called the VI SPDAT. Um, the Vulnerability Index and Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Um, uh, and the, the tool actually serves those at the top of the scale pretty well. Folks who um, are chronically homeless and really need the kind of support that can only be provided by permanent supportive housing. Um, it also serves folks at the bottom of the scale pretty well, folks who are crisis homeless and will be able to recover with just like a limited, a time and resource limited investment. Um, so they, by the, as of the writing of the book, they had managed to survey and rank 39,000 unhoused people. And they had managed to serve about 9,000 of them with some kind of resource. That's not housing, but uh, that could be also the sort of more limited resources of rapid rehousing. So help with an eviction or um, uh, moving expenses or, or, or something, a smaller amount of resource. All of those things are counted as a match in the system. Um, but then there's the 30,000 people who have been surveyed but have never received a resource through, uh, through coordinated entry. Um, people like Gary Boatwright, um, who are strong enough to survive, but not really able to get back on their feet by themselves. So when you're classified as being not vulnerable enough to merit immediate assistance, but not stable enough to be um, served by the time-limited resources of rapid rehousing, this can end up um, leaving people feeling like they have been included in a system that has asked them to incriminate themselves in exchange for a slightly higher lottery number for housing. Um, and this is, an a ter it is not a terrible analysis of how the system actually works. So the system uses this survey called the VI SPDAT um, to ask people some very um, intrusive questions about um, how they spend their days and what their experiences are. Um, the questions are actually pretty good at establishing actual vulnerability. Um, so they ask things like, um, uh, are you currently having unprotected sex? Are you currently trading sex for money or drugs? Is there someone who thinks that you owe them money? Is there an open warrant on you? Um, have you thought about harming yourself or someone else in the recent past? And then it asks where you can be found at different times of the day. And then it asks if um, the person um, doing the survey can take a picture of you. Um, folks have to sign a, a pretty comprehensive informed consent in order to do this survey. Um, but it's hard to say that that informed consent is truly voluntary because coordinated entry has really become the front door to almost all housing services in Los Angeles County. So the, the choice is really um, give folks your data and hope that that means you get matched with a better housing opportunity or um, sort of close yourself out of most avenues for um, housing resources in the county um, at all. Um, so um, once, um, once you fill out the informed consent, part of it says, um, part of the informed consent is um, that there is information available um, about who your information is shared with, but you, there's a second process that you have to go through to get that information. If you do request and manage to receive that information, um, that document says that they share your information with 161 different agencies across Los Angeles County. And because of federal data regulations and because the fact that this data is held in a homeless management information system, um, one of those agencies is the Los Angeles Police Department. Now, they're not able to get, request any old information out of the system. They're not able to say like, you know, run a query on the system that says anyone who is trading sex for drugs, like give us a list. This is not the kind of information they can get. 
Um, but they are able to request information out of the homeless management information system based only on an oral request. So there's no warranting system, there's no oversight, there's not even a paper trail. Basically it means that a line officer can just walk into a social service office and ask for information out of the system. And the worker's not required to give it to them. And I think that's really important that, that people know they, that they're not required to give it to them, but they are allowed to give it to them um, based on current federal data standards. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about, about one of the people I talked to when doing this reporting, and then we'll move on to big ideas and questions. Um, so I, um, in Los Angeles, one of the folks I talked to was a guy who goes by the nickname Uncle Gary, Gary Boatwright. So when I met Uncle Gary in um, 2016, he was living in a gray and green tent on East 6th Street on the edge of Skid Row. He's a straight-talking, wryly funny man with thinning white hair and Santa Claus blue eyes. He's had a dozen careers, welder, mason, paralegal, door-to-door -door salesman, law student, and most recently he was a document processor for a wholesale mortgage lender, um, which comes with a number of incredible ironies. Um, so since he moved to Skid Row, he has filled out the VI Spadat three times, and by the time I talked to him, he had really lost patience with the process. Um, he doesn't think he scored very high on this vulnerability scale. Um, he's 64, and other than a little high blood pressure and a hearing pro pro um, problem, he's, he's mostly healthy. Um, his substance use to me didn't seem abusive or debilitating. Um, he has a mental health diagnosis, but he doesn't actually know what it is because um, he just found out that he had a mental health file when he went to court in Orange County, but no one's ever shared his diagnosis with him. Um, the problem, though, as he sees it, is not his comparative vulnerability. It's simple math. There's not enough housing in Los Angeles for the county's 58,000 unhoused people. People like me, who are somewhat higher functioning, he said, are not getting housing. It's another way of kicking the can down the road. In order to house the homeless, you have to have the available units. Show me the units, otherwise you're just lying. So in November of 2016, as the book was going to press, Gary was arrested and he was charged with breaking the window of a public bus with a plastic 99 cent store broom, um, which when he called me from Men's Central in Los Angeles, he said is, quote, physically impossible. Um, when he got out, which is about a year ago now, um, he had lost everything. His tent, his paperwork, his relationships with local organizations and friends. Um, and if he chooses to interact with the coordinated entry system again, he'll score lower on the VI spadat because it counts incarceration as being housed. So the model will see him as less vulnerable and his priority score will skip even lower. So I can hear skeptics of the book um, in my head at all times, um, even now. Um, scary stories sell books. Virginia, like you went out, you cherry picked the worst case scenarios you can find to tell this really frightening story. Um, but here's the reality. Uh, Indiana was pretty bad. Like I, I will say that that is maybe a little bit of a black hat story. I don't know the soul of Governor Mitch Daniels, so I cannot speak to his intentions. But one of my sources said, you know, if we had built a system to divert people from public assistance on purpose, it wouldn't have worked any better than this one did. But um, in Los Angeles and in Allegheny County, the designers, the administrators, the caseworkers I spoke with were very bright, very well-intentioned people who cared deeply for the well-being of the people their agencies serve. But the reality is good intentions can still produce bad outcomes. And the time has really come to stop talking about intentions in the design of these tools and to start talking about the impacts they're having in, on people in their day-to-day -day lives right now. In fact, in, mo in both these places, both Los Angeles and Allegheny County, designers have done many of the things that progressive critics of algorithmic decision making ask them to do. They, they actually have sort of hit all the marks. Um, they've been largely transparent, though not entirely transparent. They've released most of um, the information about how their models work. Um, they've, they're mostly accountable in that the tools are held in public agencies or public-private partnerships. Um, and they've even engaged in some kinds of participatory design um, that help um, bring users of the system into the design of the tools. 
Um, in other words, these are some of our best systems, not some of our worst. So here's a challenging question that I hope the book um, asks. What if the problems with the coming age of AI and machine learning are not broken systems, are not lack of accuracy, um, or even lack of fairness, and we can talk about that a bit in a minute, but rather systems that carry out this deep social programming that I started my talk with, this, pro this dictate of the digital poorhouse uh, to create systems of moral diagnosis and divert people from um, resources that they are entitled to and deserve. What if these systems are carrying out those imperatives too well, rather than just breaking or glitching? So the designers of all the systems I studied for the book really agreed on one thing, that data analytics, uh, matching algorithms, automated decision making, all these kinds of tools are perhaps regrettable but necessary systems for doing a kind of digital triage, for deciding whose life is immediately threatened by economic inequality and who can wait. But the decision to triage at all is actually a political choice. This idea that um, we don't have enough resources and we have to make tough decisions is just that. It is an idea. And in fact, I think using the language of triage hides the fact that we're making a political choice. Because triage is really only appropriate when there are more resources coming. Um, and if there aren't more resources coming, what we're doing is not triage. It's automated rationing. And I think if that's what we're doing, we should talk about it directly. Because um, we can do better than that, and we deserve better than that. That's why I wrote the book. I believe we deserve better. I believe our people deserve better. I believe our communities deserve better. And I think the fundamental danger of the digital poorhouse is that it demands that we think small, that we sort of stay within these arbitrarily imposed limits, both to our resources and to our imagination about how we solve um, uh, uh, for economic inequality. Um, but this political moment that we're in right now, um, and justice itself really demands that we think big, that we push back against this sort of idea of austerity fever. So I don't want to leave you without a couple of um, notes on possible solutions. Um, I know that often what audiences want me to do is walk into a room and give them a five-point plan for building better technology um, or for creating more ethical data policy. Um, and I'm sorry, and you're welcome. I'm not going to do either of those things um, because I actually think this is really big work um, that we have to think about on a, on a, on a deep, um, and, and pretty profound level. So I think there's three kinds of work that have to be happening at the same time. The first is that we have to tell a different story about poverty. So we tell the story in the United States about poverty that it is an aberration, that it is something that just happens to a small percentage of m people who are maybe pathological to begin with. The reality is that 51% of us, at some point between the ages of 20 and 64, will be below the poverty line. We will be below the poverty line at some point in our adult lives, the majority of us. That nearly two thirds of us will receive means-tested public assistance. So that's not reduced price school lunches, that's not uh, social security, that's straight welfare. In our adult lives, almost two thirds of us will receive welfare. That doesn't mean we're equally vulnerable to poverty, um, that's absolutely untrue if you're a person of color, if you are a person who cares for other people, if you are born poor, if you have mental health issues, if you have physical mobility limitations, if you are a migrant, um, you have, you're much more likely to be poor and you're much more likely to stay poor once you're there. But the reality is that poverty is a majority condition in the United States. And if it is a majority condition, then spending all of our time, resources, and smarts trying to solve the problem of moral diagnosis is, a, is an extraordinary um, moral failure to I identify the, and address the real problem. I believe if we can change the kinds of stories we tell about poverty, that we can shift the politics of poverty away from this um, diagnostic moralizing and towards universal floors. One of the things that's been really profound about talking about this book outside the United States is that the kind of, thing, the kind of conditions I talk about in the book, um, in many places in the world, people immediately recognize and talk about as human rights violations. 
increasingly in the United States, we're talking about them as systems engineering problems. And I think that should give us some deep, deep pause about the state of our national soul. Because of course, we can decide as a country that there is a line below which no one is allowed to go for any reason. That no one in the United States goes hungry. That no one in the United States lives in a tent on the sidewalk. That no family in the United States is split up because a parent can't afford a child's uh, medical prescription. So as we do that work, that cultural and political work, uh, changing the story and the politics of poverty, technology is not going to just stop and sort of twiddle its robot thumbs waiting for us to get it together. So in the meantime, we also have to be talking about ways to create technologies that do less harm right now. Um, so the way we talk about design, particularly design for justice, um, often is by talking about technologies that are designed to be objective and neutral, more objective decision making makers than human beings. Um, but uh, the reality is building or designing technologies to be objective or neutral just means we're building them to support the status quo. Um, and I, the metaphor I often use to help people understand that is the metaphor of like building a car in a place that is very, um, where the landscape is very hilly and twisty and turny. A landscape, say, like San Francisco or Silicon Valley, um, where there's lots of hills and twists and turns. It's about, it's like building a car and building it with no gears. Right? And then setting it on top of one of these hills and being surprised when somehow it rockets down to the bottom of the hill and bursts into flame. The reality is we have to build these tools with equity gears installed from the beginning, um, every time. Um, this means designing these technologies with all of our values in mind. Efficiency and cost savings are important. Of course they are. Um, but they have to be balanced with other collective goals. Goals like self-determination, autonomy, dignity, fairness, equity, um, and due process. Um, if we're to have a more just future, we have to build it on purpose, bit by bit, and bite by bite, and brick by brick. If we outsource our moral responsibilities to care for each other, to computers, we really have no one but ourselves to blame when they supercharge discrimination and automate austerity. I thank you so much for your attention and for being here for this conversation. Um, I have some sort of thoughts about what's happened since I wrote the book that I'm happy to talk about if it comes up in Q&A. So I'm just going to leave this here for now so we can talk about it. Um, but thank you so much for being here. And I'm excited to hear um, your questions. Thank you. All right. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Awesome, great. Um, hi everybody, my name's Jackson. I'm with the STPP program and a master's student here at the Ford School. And I'm Laura, I'm also with the STPP program and a master's student at the School for Environment and Sustainability. We're gonna kick off the Q&A session here. We have several questions from our audience uh, for you. Um, I think what we wanna start off with first is can you tell us about proxies in the system? <laughs> See what happens when you put a slide in and then you don't talk about it? Um, yeah, so, um, and actually, it's related to, to, this, to this later work. So I'll start here and then move backwards. Um, anyone want to fess up to this being their question? Because I like to make eye contact. You don't have to. Hey, hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that's been really interesting uh, that has happened after the book came out is when I was writing the book, I really thought I had kind of two audiences. And one was folks who had experienced these systems as targets of these systems. Because I think often we need our experience confirmed um, by hearing that we're not the only person this has ever happened to. Um, and there's so much stigma in these programs that often everyone thinks they're the only person to ever um, have one of these experiences and they're often really surprised when the experience is actually super common. So I really was thinking about folks who are the targets of these systems when I was writing this book. And I was really thinking about sort of the data scientists and economists and folks who are building these models as, um, and the data for good folks and all those folks too. But the, the people I wasn't really thinking about when I wrote the book and, and I've now really had a, a fascinating continuing conversation with um, has been organizations on the ground um, who are serving people in terms of meeting their basic needs 
and are seeing these tools come um, up through the systems and are even often being asked to consult about these systems and don't always really know exactly what questions to ask when they're asked to consult. So I've gotten a bunch of really interesting phone calls from organizations like the Bronx Defenders who are like, oh, hey, they're going to move to predictive analytics in New York City and child welfare. They want us to consult. What do we ask? And one of the questions I tell them always to ask is there's a couple of like, this is the model inspection question, is like there's a couple of under the hood questions you should ask anytime you're looking at one of these models. One is the one I talked about already today, which is about the limitations of the data set. Is the data collected in ways that could introduce discriminatory impacts on the system? So if the data is only collected or over collected on one group of people and not collected on other folks. The other issue, though, that is something that people should pay a lot of attention to is the issue of proxies. So many of these models um, um, in social services don't actually have enough data to model the actual phenomena they're interested in changing. So for example, in child welfare, um, the actual harm to children is recorded on this report called the um, fatality and near fatality, child fatality and near fatality reports. Luckily for the children of Allegheny County in the world, there aren't that many of these reports filed every year, just sort of a handful every year, and some year there's none. Um, so that's good news for kids in Allegheny County. It's bad news for data scientists, because it doesn't actually provide enough data to build a rigorous model. So um, in Allegheny County, they had to choose proxies, which are just stand-ins, like little puppets, that stand in for the thing that you actually want to measure. Um, and in Allegheny County, they originally chose two proxies for that, that stood in for actual child harm in the model. One was a thing called child re-referral, and that just meant that there was a call on a family, a, a report on a child that was screened out so that, wasn't, that the family wasn't investigated, and then there's a second call on the same, fa uh, the same child within two years. Um, the second proxy was called child placements. Um, and child placement means that there's a call on a child, they decide to open an investigation, the uh, caretaker is indicated for maltreatment. Um, we never talk about guilt in child welfare because the standard of evidence is so low that it's just whether or not there's evidence that indicates something has, has happened. Um, so the, uh, the parent is indicated um, and child welfare and the courts decide to take the child out of the house and put them in foster, in, in foster care or an institution or with kin. Um, so that's child placement. Now, these aren't terrible proxies necessarily, but they, ha they are very different things than actual maltreatment having occurred. And the one that I was most concerned with um, when I was writing the book was this call re-referral proxy um, because it seemed to me that the designers of the tool were really out of touch with what actually happens around child protective um, if they did not know that nuisance calling is a thing that happens. Um, or vendetta calling, right? So it's actually common, unfortunately common, that people use calls to child welfare to harass each other. Like neighbors, somebody had a party and their neighbor gets mad and calls Child Protective. Or there's a, a couple that's breaking up and they call Child Protective on each other. Or there's like family strife and they call Child Protective on each other. So this idea that two calls on one child means harm has actually happened is really troubling, um, incredibly troubling. And I think um, introduces this structural system inequality that becomes invisible because it becomes part of this model and because it seems objective and neutral. So that was a real concern I had with this system. I think you can also have similar concerns about which children get placed in foster care, right? Particularly concerns about the system actually modeling the, this uh, children, youth, and family services own decision making, right? There's a, courts are in there too, so it's not quite that simple, um, but there can be real concerns about it actually modeling its own decision making and creating another feedback loop there. Since the book was published, they've stopped using the child re-referral proxy. Um, no causal relationship that I know of. Um, but uh, they are still using, um, now they're using one proxy, and the proxy is, is child placement. Um, so the proxies are really these kinds of lenses that um, 
might allow you to see better if they're good lenses, but if they're not good lenses, might really distort your vision in systemic ways. And so proxies are something, if you're not measuring the thing you want to change directly, you have to be really, really thoughtful. You really have to take apart um, the, those pieces of the system to, to know whether, whether and what kinds of concerns to have about it. So that's proxies. Thanks. I promise the next questions will be, the next answers will be shorter. That was a little bit in the technical weeds. That's why, that's why I, I skipped it, but it's fascinating. Thank you. That's great. Um, our next question is, why is the U.S. conception of poverty more biased towards judgment and punishment compared mm. to other countries? Yeah, God, that's a fascinating question. Can somebody else want to take this one? This is a... Um, so uh, what I will say is at the moment we were moving towards poor houses, the much of the rest of the world was moving towards universal, uh, more universal programs. Um, you know, my, um, my admittedly hypothetical answer to that or like my uh, idiosyncratic answer to that um, is that I think it's a mix of the real disdain and hatred we have historically showed towards poor and working people in this country combined with racism, with the history of um, racial discrimination. That means we create social service programs um, that are intended to block people of color from receiving help. Um, and because, we, because white people allow that to happen, um, then we also suffer under those same programs. I actually think this is a great um, point of possible political mobilization, um, uh, particularly now, um, if we could sort of um, find the way to work uh, across some of those experiences. It's actually one of the things that I think is really um, potentially a, a point of uh, hope and optimism around these systems. Um, is, I mean, we were supposed to get a poorhouse in every single county in the United States. It didn't work out that way, partially because they ended up being way more expensive than the economic elites thought they would be, so they were like, no, screw it, stop. Um, second, because they were also institutions that physically contained huge groups of poor and working people together for long periods of time, where they like sat and ate meals and took care of each other's kids and uh, you know nursed each other when they were sick and also did horrible things to each other as well. But the reality was they became these places that became sort of nodes of resistance in interesting ways. Um, and, um, and that likely was a reason that they called kibosh on them as well. Um, one of my concerns about the digital poorhouse rather than the original institution of the poorhouse is that it, could, it can serve many of the same disciplinary and punitive purposes of a physical institution without actually gathering people physically together in the same space in a way that might create solidarity. The, the, the ray of hope here, I think, is that the, the, these systems scale so quickly and um, uh, are networked so deeply that they actually touch all of our lives very quickly. Um, and so I think they might also offer an opportunity for us to see our experiences mirrored in each other and to use that as a way to do political organizing that can unseat this sort of deep um, cultural understanding of poverty as a moral failing. Um, I think that's hard work. We have hard work to do around that. Um, that's a great question. Thank you for whoever, whoever that was. Thanks. Okay, uh, next question. So this question is in regard to uh, data that we gathered in the pre-automated mm -hmm. system. Yep. Um, what happened to the data that we generated in the early to mid 20th century uh, case worker model? Mm -hmm. uh, and is a return to that sort of the, the strong case work, uh, is a return to strong case work an option or mm -hmm. desirable relative to this new system? Yeah, so there's sort of two questions in there. Um, I'm going to answer the first one fast and take a tiny bit more time with the, the second one. So um, uh, massive data collection on poor people is not new with digital data collection, right? So one of the things I talk about in the book um, is like the eugenics movement, um, which was um, part of its specific goal was to gather information about the sort of um, social diseases of poor, particularly poor white families, and um, to um, keep them from breeding. Um, uh, so it was a deeply racist project of trying to sort of cleanse the white race from within um, by identifying these degenerate white families. Um, 
Uh, so the one of the things I say in the book is that the eugenics record office um, in Cold Spring, New York, was probably the first big data set of the poor in the United States. Um, so this is not new. Um, what is new is the potential for this data to last forever. Um, and uh, librarians, particularly in the room, will like roll their eyes because you know that like if, if you have a jazz disc somewhere in your home, you know that just because it's digital doesn't mean you can access it later. But the reality is that paper records or photographic slides take up space um, and eventually they have to get put away somewhere far away. They're not as integrated, they're not as easy to um, access as digital data is. Um, so the second part of that question, which I think is also really interesting, is, is the solution a return to strong casework? Um, because I think the, the, it gets to some of the real deep tensions at the heart of this work. So there's two, I think, really almost irreconcilable tensions in this work. One is around integration, which is around how, to, how connecting data across different systems can both help and hurt poor and working people. So one of the real barriers to benefit receipt in the United States is how hard it is to apply, right? So you have to apply, if you need home, health, home heating assistance, food, and um, Section 8 housing, um, you're going to spend three days in each office filling out the same application and waiting in extraordinary lines. Um, and this acts as a kind of diversion um, so that integrating that data could actually lower barriers for receipt. If we had a system that was meant to help people get access to the things they are entitled to and deserve, um, and if we didn't live in a culture that criminalized poverty. But in fact, we live in a culture that criminalizes poverty. So integrating those systems also creates this spectacular surveillance net that makes it very difficult to have any degrees of freedom inside the system. So, the, which leads to the second real tension, which is around discretion. So the reality is that caseworker discretion can be one of the worst things that happen that can happen to you, um, and it in fact is one of the reasons that people of color were blocked from getting any real access to public services for like 35 years until the. National Welfare Rights Movement, um, but also under a system that's not necessarily set up to help you get to your entitlements. Um, caseworker discretion is the, really the only thing that I ever saw work in 15 years of welfare rights organi organizing to actually get people what they needed. So the struggle there is thinking about this sort of bigger question of does, in the system that we have right now, does justice demand an ability to bend the rules? And if it does demand an ability to bend the rules, how do we do that in an equitable way? Um, so, you know, the answer to that is like more casework, yes. Like, well, <laughs> like more of the right kind of casework, I think, could certainly um, uh, improve the situation. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's a simple return to what we were doing 30 years ago, which, you know, wasn't working for everyone. The next question is, why can't the database systems for access to public services be deprived of racial information? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in Allegheny County, for example, they don't use race as um, um, a variable um, in their model. Um, and this comes back to this proxy slide. Um, the reality, though, uh, is in a deeply segregated society, there are about a million variables that stand in for that stand in as proxies for for race. So, neighborhood um, interactions with the criminal justice system, um, public school that you go to, lots of these things can stand in for race in some profound ways. So, one of the challenges is um, that removing race from these systems doesn't necessarily actually change the racialized nature of the data because race is institutionalized in these systems in, in some pretty profound and important ways. Um, and also, I'm not sure that pulling race out of these models is actually useful because it may just hide the processes by which um, data is being racialized. Um, so I want to be able to keep track of, uh, right, is this model producing racially discriminatory outcomes? And we can't do that if we're not, if, if race isn't one of the variables. Okay, uh, thank you. Next question. Um, regarding uh, kind of like the return, the new in vogue use of uh, work requirements mm -hmm. for things that were previously yeah. kind of maybe insufficient or not, not adequate universal floors, 
uh, especially like here in the state of Michigan, we have work requirements that were just implemented for both SNAP and for Medicaid. Um, and some of these are pretty steep. I think New Hampshire has a 100 hour a month work requirement for uh, Medicaid eligibility. Yeah. Um, what is the role of this, these kind of data collection systems in implementing these, these means tests uh, beyond just policing poor people, but actually affecting the benefits that they receive from the government? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the stories I start the book with is um, a story about a woman who goes by a pseudonym in my writing. She and I worked closely together um, many years ago, but when I was doing uh, more scholarly or academic writing, so she was, um, uh, her identity was anonymized. Um, so she goes by the pseudonym uh, Dorothy Allen um, in my books. Um, and Dorothy and I in 2000 were sitting in a uh, uh, technology lab that we had helped build together in a residential YWCA in Troy, New York. So it's a, a housing for low-income women. Um, and we were talking about her um, electronic benefits transfer card, her EBT card which is the sort of debit-like card that you get public assistance benefits on. Um, and they were fairly new um, in 2000. So, so we were just sort of shooting the breeze about it one day. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, like some people have told me that, you know, that they prefer EBT cards because, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more convenient and it kind of lowers the visibility of using food stamps in the grocery store. And, and she said, yeah, you know, that's true and it's not in some ways. Um, there's, there's some things that I really like about the EBT card, but she said, but, um, my caseworker also uses them as a way to track all of my purchases. And I must've had this like super shocked look on my face. Cause she kind of pointed at me and laughed for like three minutes. Like kind of cried a little bit and like patted my knee for a while. Like, oh, oh pumpkin. Um, and then she like, she got a little quieter and she was like, oh, Virginia. She was like, you know, you all, meaning sort of like professional middle class people, you all should pay attention to what's happening to us, people on public assistance, because they're coming for you next. Um, and this was like 18, almost 19 years ago now. Um, so I feel like, and this is why Dorothy's always in the back of my head, is because that's like a remarkable prescience. Um, and really influence the way that I do my work in that I'm always looking for the folks who are the targets of these systems to speak first, not the only stories I tell, but the most important stories I tell. Um, because these are folks who are already living in the future of these technologies. Um, they are experts in how they work. Um, and their experiences say a lot about what's going to happen to everyone in the future. I'm not saying you should only care about this because it might influence, it might impact you at some point. That's messed up. Like there's a moral argument to care about it if it's only happening to poor folks. It's, we should still care. Um, but um, I think Dorothy's right. And one of the things that's been really troubling for me this year has been if you look at the 2019 federal budget, um, it says really clearly that the um, Trump administration um, plans to save $88 billion over the next 10 years in middle class entitlement programs in um, disability and unemployment insurance and social security by using these same tools. Um, and it's deeply concerning to me um, that this, both of these tools have been tested on folks who live in what you can sort of consider as low rights environments, um, who are especially vulnerable, and that uh, these tools are being ramped up to be used on pretty much everyone. Um, this, is, this is deeply, deeply concerning um, for me. Um, so I think um, it's not an accident that this stuff is all happening at the same time, right? That like we're getting um, this expansion of work requirements, that we're getting this expansion of sanctions um, into non-TANF programs at the same time that we're building technological capacity to do it so efficiently. Um, and, and in the political moment that we're in right now, which is a moment that's really characterized by deep economic suffering ethnic and racial nationalism, um, and deep, deep distrust of government, um, right? So I just actually just did a talk in Finland for a bunch of social workers in Finland. And one of the things that was so fascinating about being there is they just have this incredible trust for their government. Um, so they're like, oh, no, we have one card. It has everything on it. Medical records, public, like, our voting, like, public assistance, schooling. And I, I just, like, kept getting more and more ashen, like, as they kept saying this. And then I had this moment where I was like, I'm both super jealous of you all for trusting your government that 
that much. And I feel like I like you're a toddler whose hand I need to smack away from a fire um, because you should stop giving this data to your government. And I'm like, why did you invite me here? Like, why am I here? Um, do you just want to feel morally superior? And they were like, well, a little. And I was like, yeah, I know. Thanks for the flight to Helsinki, though. I'm going to the sauna now. Um, but, um, but, but they also said, you know, look, we think these tools are coming everywhere. And we, they actually just um, voted in a, a much more conservative government than they had in a really long time. And um, they were really concerned about what happens when you trust the government enough to give them all your data, and then there's regime change. And I was like, oh, yeah, we know a lot about this. Uh, I'm like, let's talk about this. So like, I think the best example of when this becomes a real problem is something like the DACA database, the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrival database, right? Under the Obama administration, this, the idea to try to um, help defer the deportations of children who are brought to this, to this country um, and don't have legal status. Um, something like 800,000 youth, uh, young people and young, uh, young adults gave their information um, to this database and like 2016 suddenly it turns into a database that can be used directly for deportation, right? So like one of the big questions that I'm asking that I don't have an answer for yet but I'm really interested in having this conversation is, is there a way we can build these tools to have unhackable values, right? So you can't use them against their original intent. Um, and so like these larger values of justice, equity, autonomy, and self-determination are built in in a way that you can't undo them. And I don't know that that's possible, but I'm interested in having that, that conversation. Long answer, but a good question. Um, thank you. Great, and this will be the last question that we have time for. Um, but we know from the sociological literature that there are class differences in parenting. To what degree are we criminalizing working class parenting using the standards of con concerted cultivation? Wait, say so what the last thing is? Is that what that says? I think so. Um, the last part is, to what degree are we criminalizing working class parenting using the standards of concerted cultivation? Okay, so I don't know what concerted cultivation is, so, so I can't answer that question, yeah. So this is my question, I'll yeah. clarify for a second. Yeah. Um, so in the book, Mm -hmm. uh, LaRoe talks about like working class families are much more likely to have kids go play in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. have latchkey kids um, while they work. Um, are we sort of making illegal that style of parenting by the upper middle class mm -hmm. standard of your child should be supervised at all times? Yeah, so that's a great question. Not one that I know that I'm prepared to like definitively answer, but what I can say is that one of my concerns about these technological systems um, is that we think of them as sort of simple administrative upgrades and not as political decision-making machines. And in fact, they are political decision-making machines. And for example, we can easily program them in ways we don't even really understand ourselves to uphold a particular kind of standard for parenting or um, you know, responsible work behavior or disability or whatever um, in ways that produce these automated inequalities. And that really is the, the concern that I'm writing about in the book. Um, so I think um, one of the um, things that understanding these systems as political decision-making machines helps us do is recognize that there are lots of different kinds of expertise that need to be in the room when we're talking about these things. So we tend to say like, well, we need data scientists, we need economists, we might need a social scientist, um, and what maybe a data ethicist that's becoming like a thing, right? Like maybe one of those people. But the reality is that if you don't know from the ground um, about community values um, and uh, community cultures, then you may well build into these tools um, the kinds of decisions and um, uh, models that don't make sense for, for people on the ground. Um, and what I'll say is um, Kathy Volponi, who worked for an organization in Pittsburgh that um, helped to support parents who have been accused of maltreatment, um, said, you know, one of the things we do in this system is once you get in the door, we raise the standard on your parenting so high um, that, that failure, while it doesn't become inevitable, becomes much more likely. Um, so we raise the standard on your parenting so high, and then we can't offer you the resources to keep your parenting up there. Um, that, that's really one of the, the, um, the, the major problems in the system. 
I mean, I also think one of the major problems with the system is because we've shredded the child welfare system, um, is because we shredded the social safety net in other places. The child welfare system has basically become the resource supplier of last resort for poor families. Um, but that means that you have to make this horrible trade off of, say, like a request support to keep your family healthy and safe. But in requesting it, agree that the state now has the authority to remove your kids. So child welfare is not means tested. You can be any class, any income, and use the child welfare system. But families that have the resources to avoid it, avoid it because of that trade-off. Because that trade-off is, is an unfair thing to ask parents to do. Um, so I think part of the issue is just that our child welfare system mixes these two um, goals of protecting families and prosecuting um, prosecuting maltreatment. And I think there's a bigger lesson in that for these systems, right? Because there's a way that these systems um, increase the policing imper imperative of social service systems and integrate social service systems more deeply with um, processes and systems of policing, um, which is why I think many of these systems can be seen as, criminal as profoundly criminalizing. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thanks. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. And thank you, Professor Eubanks, for coming and speaking to us at the Ford School. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And, we'll and uh, we invite everybody to join us in the Great Hall for the reception and uh, to continue our conversations and, and have some snacks. <laughs> thank you so much.